The action of the film begins in a large modern city, the name of which remains unknown. A young taxi driver suddenly stops his car in the middle of the road because he unexpectedly loses his sight. A passerby offers to help him and takes the driver's seat. They drive to the taxi driver's home, and the driver describes his condition. It's as if he sees shadows floating in a fog. The helper is surprised, saying that blindness is supposed to be black. When they stop at a crosswalk, the helper informs the driver that they have arrived at his home. However, as soon as the driver steps out, the kind helper steps on the gas and drives away, leaving the helpless man in the middle of the road. The man asks passers-by for help, and one of them escorts him home and helps him get to his apartment. The taxi driver's wife is very concerned about her husband's condition. She quickly finds an ophthalmologist's phone number and takes her husband to an appointment, shocked by the thief's behavior in robbing a blind man so easily. The doctor examines the taxi driver but finds no visual impairments. He writes down the results of the examination and advises the young man to be admitted to the hospital for a full checkup. The couple returns home. Meanwhile, the doctor continues his practice, examining the next patients, including a child, a woman in dark glasses, and a one-eyed old man. Later, he returns home and tells his wife about the strange case. They spend a quiet evening together, while one of the doctor's patients goes to a pharmacy, buys medication, and takes a taxi to a hotel because she works as a call girl. She keeps her dark glasses on as the doctor instructed, and isn't too surprised when everything before her eyes turns white. The frightened client throws her out into the corridor in her negligee, and the woman asks the hotel staff for help. Meanwhile, the doctor's wife wakes up earlier than him and prepares morning coffee. Suddenly, the doctor announces that he can't see anything and assumes that he was infected by yesterday's patient. The man has a panic attack, and only when his wife helps him calm down does he contact his colleagues. They also begin to record strange cases of sudden blindness, but they still don't understand what's happening. The white blindness spreads rapidly, and an ambulance arrives to take the doctor away. His wife tries to get into the same vehicle, but they refuse to take her until she claims that she too has suddenly lost her sight. The couple is taken to a facility repurposed for quarantine, which is immediately declared by the government. The doctor and his wife are the first to find themselves in the large room, numbered one. Although the husband insists that his wife confess that she can still see and go home, she refuses. Soon, more patients arrive in the ward. Among them are the taxi driver, the thief, the call girl, and the child. The taxi driver recognizes the thief by his voice, and a fight breaks out, which the doctor barely manages to stop. Later, the people start to settle into their new environment. The doctor's wife tries to help them adapt, guiding them to the toilet and advising them to count their steps and memorize all the turns and doors. One day, an unfortunate incident occurs when the call girl accidentally scrapes the skin off the thief's leg with her heel. The doctor's wife provides first aid since the real doctor can't see anything. The doctor's wife worries that they might have introduced an infection because they have no antiseptics. Her husband asks her to forget about it as they can't change anything. One day she goes for a walk and hears the guard's warnings that only infected people are allowed to be here. At that moment, more people arrive. These include a police officer, a pharmacist's assistant, a hotel maid, and a financial advisor who turns out to be the taxi driver's wife. Upon hearing her familiar voice, he calls out to her, and they find each other with difficulty. The newcomers settle in. The doctor, hearing the guards' voices, asks them to bring medicine as he needs to help the injured. But they point their guns at him, promising to shoot him and his wife if they don't return to their ward. Due to isolation from the outside world and the growing number of patients, living conditions in the quarantine facility gradually deteriorate. The call girl takes the child under her wing, who keeps asking for his mother. Meanwhile, the maid remembers the woman in glasses who infected her, unaware that she is nearby. Soon, food becomes scarce. The only sighted person, the doctor's wife, tries to call emergency numbers, but no one answers. The next day, a new group of patients arrives, including the ophthalmologist's assistant. The doctor's wife tries her best to maintain order. She comes up with the idea of stretching ropes between the wards so that people can move around. The doctor, on the other hand, focuses on the toilets, as the people can't see what's happening there. The patients often go outside to escape the smells, but their mood changes drastically. One day, the taxi driver's wife falls into a depression and stops talking to her husband. The doctor's wife is concerned about the lack of soap, but is grateful that there is at least water and forces everyone to take hygiene measures. One day, a one-eyed old man comes to their ward with a radio. He shares the news. In the first 24 hours, there were many infected people. Helpless doctors were involved in continuous conferences because no one knew what to do, but then they too started going blind. Weeks pass and many people are forcibly sent to quarantine. One day a bus accident occurs, killing 23 people. On the same day, two planes collide, causing panic. 
There are more and more accidents and people begin staying home. By now, almost everyone has gone blind. After telling his story, the one-eyed man plays music, and while it plays, everyone silently listens as if it were a greeting from a bright past. Many cry. More and more people arrive at the quarantine facility, and soon the guards, unable to maintain order and not wanting to be near the infected, begin shooting at violators, even unwitting ones. The first deaths occur. The quarantine residents ask for a shovel to bury them. The doctor's wife goes outside to get it. She continues pretending to be blind and finds it very difficult to hold back when she realizes that the guard is simply mocking her. The woman silently picks up the shovel, and although the guards are very surprised by this, they attribute it to her quick adaptation. The doctor urges each ward to bury one of the dead, but others refuse to listen to him. When it comes to fair food distribution, an armed patient from the third ward declares himself king and takes control of all the food. Meanwhile, the thief develops an infection and soon realizes that the doctor's wife can still see. It becomes increasingly difficult for her to hide her sight and she often cries. One night, the thief goes outside and provokes the guard to shoot. The next day, the doctor and a few people from his ward bury the dead. The man confesses to his wife that it is very difficult for him that she is taking care of him, but the woman asks him to accept this fact and walks away, taking advantage of the fact that her husband can't see her. The next day, the king announces new rules. Now anyone who wants to eat has to pay for it. He mockingly sings for everyone, demanding that his supporters sing along. Later, a real battle for food breaks out, but fearing the weapons, no one dares to resist. The king demands valuable items in exchange for food, and he realizes that the doctor's wife can see. Her husband tries to rally everyone for resistance, but people don't understand the value of their jewelry anymore. After all, they are of no use now, so people take off all the expensive things they have. The doctor's wife collects them, and her husband exchanges them for food. He suddenly realizes that one of the king's henchmen is blind from birth, which is why he feels great controlling the food and valuables. The doctor tries to shame him, but in the end, their ward receives much less food than they need. He feels guilty for what has happened and refuses to eat. The call girl tries to persuade him to accept the new order, as living after taking someone else's life is very difficult. They share an intimate moment which his wife witnesses. She confesses to the call girl that she can see and forgives what has happened. A week passes and people run out of valuables. Then the king orders that women be brought to him and his henchmen in exchange for food. The doctor's wife tries to appeal to the guards, but they say they are already giving everything they can. Arguments break out among the people. Some men call for ignoring the king's demands, but others are willing to share their women. The doctor is against his wife participating, but he can't insist on his opinion. So some women, including the call girl and the doctor's wife, volunteer to go and get food for everyone. The taxi driver tries to stop his wife from doing this, but she leaves. A total of nine women volunteer. The doctor's wife leads them to the third ward, lining them up in a chain. This causes cheers from the king and his henchmen. An orgy begins. The doctor's wife ends up with the king, who has remembered her voice for a long time and now takes revenge for all the insults she has previously thrown at him. Later, the women return, bringing with them one of them who has been killed in the heat of the moment by the king's henchmen. The women do their best to clean her up and say their goodbyes. The next night, the king announces that tonight he and his henchmen expect the women from the second ward. The blind man from birth comes to ask if those who visited them yesterday have recovered. The doctor's wife tells him about the death of one of them. He falls silent and leaves. The doctor's wife takes scissors and goes to the third ward. She finds the king busy and kills him, but the blind man from birth recognizes her by her steps and grabs a gun. He orders her to be caught, but the women flee. Before leaving, the doctor's wife promises that for each day without food, one of the third ward's residents will die, and she won't miss. The woman tells her husband everything, and he realizes that they are in for a war. He orders the doors to be barricaded. After some arguments, the men in his ward suddenly decide to go and simply take the food. Twelve volunteers gather, led by the doctor's wife. But at that moment, one of the rape victims starts a fire. The king's henchman, frightened, begins shooting, and people run in all directions. The doctor's wife leads the people from her ward into the courtyard. She calls for the guards, but no one responds. Then the woman opens the gates and realizes that no one is guarding them. The infected head into a half-ruined city filled with garbage and corpses. Everywhere, surviving groups clash over food. The doctor's wife finds a relatively intact store and leads her people inside. She orders them to lock up and not let other groups wandering the city inside. Her husband goes with her and she tells him that only the blind are around. Soon they find a looted supermarket. The woman circles it and finds a descent into a basement filled with food. 
She fills entire bags, but as she is leaving, a crowd that has smelled the food follows her. The doctor helps her fight them off and drags her out of the raging group. After moving a little away, he leaves her to go back for a lost jacket. The woman sits on the steps and sees nearby how dogs are tearing apart the body of a dead person. She weeps in grief and horror as the rain begins. The doctor's wife goes to a nearby church where one of the pastors is trying to preach something. There she notices her husband and goes out to him. They return to their people, who are washing in the rain, rejoicing in the water. They are happy that the doctor and his wife have returned and rush to hug them. Later, everyone rests in the store, and the doctor's wife suggests that they all move to their home. It is big and comfortable, and everyone can settle down there. They thank their fate that their leader is a sighted person. The group sets off. The doctor's wife talks about what is happening around them, and people describe themselves, their hair, and eyes so that their friends can imagine them. Soon they arrive at the house. The door is locked, but that doesn't mean no one is inside, so they act cautiously. The doctor's wife asks them to remove their dirty clothes, as they have enough clean clothes for everyone. Later, people tidy themselves up, making jokes about their appearance for the first time. The doctor's wife helps everyone wash thoroughly. Suddenly, the one-eyed old man confesses that he is happy. He has found a family, and for the first time, he wants to live with someone, helping them and caring for people. Later, everyone sits down at the table and raises a toast to the human family. In the morning, the doctor's wife puts things in order and suggests holding a meeting to establish rules of conduct, as there isn't much food left. And suddenly, the first infected, the taxi driver, announces that he can see everything around him. His sight has returned as unexpectedly as it had left. People rush to embrace each other, as this means that the blindness is temporary. Everyone rejoices, realizing that the disease will soon pass. They will be able to see again, and this time people will truly open their eyes. And the doctor's wife suddenly realizes that her heavy burden has ended and she has become free. The film shows people of completely different ages, nationalities, genders, and professions united by one misfortune. But how differently they react to the disaster that has befallen them. One thing remains unchanged, the conclusion that a person must remain human, and only this can save and show the way to the light, even in total darkness.